Today's gospel reading is like episode two of a Netflix series. The story has been set up in the first episode, the plot lines established, and then in episode two, suddenly the storyline takes a very unexpected turn just to keep you watching all the way through. If you recall last week's gospel, the scene opener has Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth. Nazareth, his hometown, where he grew up. He's been away traveling and teaching for a short while and comes home and goes to the synagogue, presumably with his family. And he was the reader of the day. I wonder what their roster system was like. He's given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah to read and he unrolls it to find the piece he wants to read or maybe it was the piece set down for the day, we're not sure. But imagine the camera close up What will he read, this local boy who has suddenly become a bit famous? Well, as it turns out, he reads a very familiar piece from Isaiah chapter 61. Familiar, that is, to his listeners. It would have been a very commonly read piece, a bit like our reading from 1 Corinthians 13 today, one of the best known pieces in their scripture. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then imagine the camera panning across the congregation as we're told the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. They knew that this passage spoke about the Messiah for whom they waited the Messiah, the one who would redeem Israel and toss out the nasty Romans. And sure enough, Jesus claims that Messiah status and says to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the credits roll of the fir- in the first episode as people's faces begin to change from interest and even amazement to anger and our Netflix audience is left wondering why. What has he said to make them angry? Isn't it great that he might be the one? And so our lectionary is like old fashioned TV. We have to wait till this week to see what happens. With Netflix, of course, we just roll right on and get into the story. Episode two that we heard read today opens a bit ambiguously. The next verse sounds like they're all still welcoming what Jesus said. All spoke well of him and were amazed, amazed, wondering, amazed, glad, amazed, horrified at the gracious words that came from his mouth. Is not this Joseph's son? But it could also be read with a bit more of a condemning tone. Is this not Joseph's son? Who is he to tell us stuff? What a joke. Who does he think he is claiming to be the Messiah? He's the boy we grew up with. And then the mood darkens a bit more. There's a bit of rumbling as they realize, hang on a minute, he's actually not quite finished the reading from Isaiah. He's missed off a crucial line. In fact, he stopped halfway through a sentence. The last line should have read, I have come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Vengeance on the Gentile invaders who sacked Jerusalem in 587, and by implication, the Roman invaders now. Isaiah goes on to promise that these Gentiles, these enemies, will have vengeance uh, wrought upon them. They will become the servants or the slaves of the people of Israel as they rebuild their cities. Jesus leaves all that part out. And then he goes on to give a sermon of sorts. He starts with a bit of a health warning. What I'm about to say, you're not gonna like. A prophet is never accepted in his hometown after all. Then he tells a couple of quick stories from the book of Kings. Be a kind of flashback scene, I guess. He says there was a famine in the land and who did the great prophet Elijah help? Not his own people, but a widow from Zarephath and Sidon, a nasty Gentile, a foreigner. And what about the great prophet Elijah? Who did he heal? A Syrian general named Naaman, another foreigner. Was there any more to the sermon than that? Is that all he said? We don't know. 
But it seemed that the people in the synagogue that day knew their scriptures well enough to join the dots. Jesus was highlighting the ways that God and God's prophets, even in ancient times, always ministered to the outsider. And Jesus, in editing off the Day of Vengeance line, was doing the same. The Day of Vengeance is not here, but the Day of Release for the captives is. The Day of Release for those held captive by their own hatred of others, for those held captive by their desire to exclude and to build walls around their communities. He's telling them that God's love is for everyone, no exceptions and no questions asked. As Susan said in her sermon last week, people all of a sudden realized they were the ones who were gonna have to do the changing. It's no longer a case of blame the Romans, blame Mr. Trump, blame whatever politician is the baddie of the week. Today, now, in this synagogue, in this town, today, Jesus wanted to change lives and set people free. Set them free from their own oppression of each other, from their exclusion of the outsider, from their own hatred. And especially from their hatred of those of a different religion or a different ethnic group. They were gonna to have to change and let go of their sense of power and entitlement and let go of their assumptions. Well, when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of town and led him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so they might hurl him off a cliff. The punishment for blasphemy was indeed to be thrown off a cliff and or stoned to death. Jesus, in their eyes, was a, ba a blasphemer, reinterpreting their understanding of God and reinterpreting the great prophet Isaiah. How dare he, one of their own, come and do that in their synagogue and then tell them that they had to change. Somehow, it's not really clear how, Jesus walks away. So often I think we sanitize Jesus. We turn his preaching into something sweet and nice which we can package up. Love one another, of course we do. Paul's famous passage about love which we also heard today, so often read at weddings because it's a great recipe for love, but it's not at all about romantic love. It also follows on from last week's episode from Paul about the body and how we need all of the parts of the body to be valued to work together. How do we do that? By learning about love, which is patient and kind and not envious or boastful or rude. Love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It's not love with a heart tied up with a bow, it's love that embraces pain and hurt and sorrow, and love that can stand up to and stare down hatred and exclusion. Maybe that's how Jesus managed to pass through the midst of them and go on his way. He loved them, looked at them, and knew them, and they stepped back from killing him this time anyway. It wasn't to be so, of course, three years later. But even then, he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. So what would episode three in our next flick series be? What if Jesus walked in here to be the reader or the preacher? What if he chose the same passage and said he has come here to bring good news to the poor, to release us from our captivity, to give us sight, to set us free, to set us free from our own hatred and blindness. What or who do we hate? Who would we exclude from our midst, from our family, from our workplace, from our church, from our nation. This week, as we mark Waitangi Day, 
who might we be excluding from our country? Jesus holds us to account and invites us to lay down our fear, our self-righteousness, our racism, and invites us to walk with him. He offers to set us free even when we fail time and time again. There are lots of examples of the kind of hatred and, and exclusion Jesus was preaching about in our world. It's easy to see it out there. Trump's wall, Israel's wall, immigrants in Europe, refugees in Australia, all issues for us to be concerned about. But Jesus preached this sermon to his own people in his own town. So let's start again today with ourselves. And today, let's respond to his invitation to come to the table ready to be made free.